it will focus on the surgical aspect of this treatment. In a second portion, Dr. Amir Faraji will specifically talk about uh, surgical details in terms of how the surgery is done for deep brain stimulation for movement disorders, uh, what's happened when the patient comes to the hospital, all the process until we place the final electrodes. And, uh, and finally, uh, Danielle Corson, a physician assistant here in our center, will talk about what will be the, what happens after the implantation, how we program the patients and how is the follow-up and the expected results. So without any further delays, I would like to just uh, as an introduction, I would like to talk about what is the spectrum of what we call deep brain stimulation. So in our country, uh, this is uh, data from 2017, we have uh, approximately 66% of our treat population uh, corresponds to patients with Parkinson's disease. As a second group, we have essential tremor of 21.5%, 21.6%, and then finally dystonia is 8.2%. So those are the three main pathologies that are treated with uh, deep brain stimulation. So to talk about some additional epidemiology, related to deep brain stimulation as primary treatment. Uh, so we have Parkinson's disease, we have approximately 680 Americans, essential tremor, approximately 6 million, 7 million, and primary dystonia, half a million Americans. Uh, many of those patients will eventually, at some point, develop medically resistant symptoms that will impact their quality of life and should be considered for surgical interventions. Our first line of treatment uh, is medication but a good portion of those patients will fail medication at some point in their lifespan, and deep brain stimulation becomes a reasonable option of treatment for those patients. Specifically talking about Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is caused by neurons degeneration cells that degenerate to produce dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. So over this, lifespan of this disease, we have the uh, appearance of certain symptoms that are characteristics of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the posture, the back rigidity, um, the tremor in the legs and arms, the mass face, and the forward tilt of the trunk are all symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. And as you can see by this graph, this is a progressive disease. I'm not trying to say that this will happen in all the patients and the, uh, the speed of this progression, uh, it varies from patient to patient. Some patients will progress more slowly and other patients will progress more rapidly. So this is related, it's an individual, there is a variability here. So we have motor symptoms and no motor symptoms. And in general, the first symptoms that occur with Parkinson's disease is some sleep changes followed by some symptoms of depression. And then we have constipation, anxiety. And then finally, we have some uh, degree of bradykinesia, which slowly, slowness of movements, rigidity, and then tremor. And those symptoms will progress to fluctuations of those symptoms, dyskinesia, uh, axial deformity, and finally falls. And this will be the later stage. Uh, so this is a progressive disease, and as I said, uh, some patients will develop this, those symptoms in a more fast pace, other patients in a more slower pace. So uh, the medical treatment for Parkinson's disease is what we call dopamine replacement. Again, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is produced by uh, certain neurons in a specific area in the brain. And the disease is caused by the death of those neurons. And with depletion of dopamine in the central nervous system, this is how the symptoms will occur. So in the early phases of Parkinson's disease, there is a fluctuation of symptoms, what we call on symptoms and off symptoms. And this fluctuation with the medication, with the replacement of dopamine, or more precisely, 
L uh, label DAPA, uh, the symptoms, the fluctuation occurs in a very smooth way, as you can see here uh, on the graph located on the, on the left side. So in general, the fluctuation stays within the range of well-controlled patients. However, with the time progression of the disease with more need for uh, level DOPA and higher dose of medication, what happened is there is now a much more abrupt fluctuation that will uh, go from off symptoms to on symptoms and to on symptoms with dyskinesia, which is a side effect of the high doses related to the high doses of levodopa. So as, I can, as you can see here, there is the appearance of off symptoms, which is the rigidity. Uh, there is still the presence of on symptoms. And now we have the additional side effects of the medication, which are the dyskinesias. Unfortunately, this happens again, in the late phase of Parkinson's disease. Um, again, the, this varies from patient to patient. I don't wanna say that uh, specifically all the patients will go to this late phase, but this is the natural history, unfortunately, of this disease. So when medication fails and when we have the side effects with the medication, with dyskinesia and off uh, symptoms, that's where perhaps DBS should be considered. There are some works that propose DBS as an early phase for, uh, in the progression of the disease in order to prevent the progression of, of uh, Parkinson's disease, but this is controversial at this point. So it's important to understand that there are symptoms that can be improved with deep brain stimulation, and there are symptoms that cannot be helped with DBS or likely will not help. So the uh, on time, the increase in on time is uh, an expectations that should be expected with the DBS. The decrease in bradykinesia and rigidity are other symptoms that truly can be helpful, can be improved with the brain stimulation. Definitely the reduction of medication dose with the DBS is an achievable goal. And with the reduction of medication comes the improvement of the side effects of that excessive medication, which are the dyskinesias. And of course, the brain stimulation works for treatment of tremor. There are the symptoms that are much more difficult to be treated with the brain stimulation. And the results are not so successful as the other symptoms that you see here on the left side. On the right side, we have the symptoms that cannot be helped or that are minimally helped with DBS, which is in general related to the gait and balance problems. Cognition cannot be improved with DBS. Again, DBS is designed to improve uh, the motor symptoms related to Parkinson's disease and not to any other cognition problems that the patients will have. And depression definitely DBS is not designed to control depression or to improve depression, but it can be a consequence of improvement in tremors, improvement of symptoms, and improvement in life, quality of life. And this can, of course, improve um, uh, the depression symptoms, but it's not precisely decided or precisely indicated for depression. Specifically talking about the brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, the targets, the areas in the brain where we place the electrodes are very, very specific. Those are small areas and it requires a very precise implantation technique. And I believe Dr. Faraji is gonna explain that in a few minutes. But shortly, there are basically two targets in the brain that are appropriate for the treatment of Parkinson's disease for deep brain stimulation. One target is called the globus pallidus interna, also known as GPI. And the second target is the subthalamic nucleus, also known as STN. And you can see here in A, the implantation of the GPI, and in B, the implantation of the STN. In fact, those two areas are very close together we're talking about perhaps a distance that is between one or 1 1.5 centimeters. 
but for the brain is a huge distance. Uh, and both targets are located in the center of the head, in the middle uh, of uh, the, uh, the brain tissue. Uh, what is the science behind the brain stimulation? We have good quality papers, scientific papers, and if you'd like to have more details, uh, we can give you the reference so you can understand from a scientific point of view why we do deep brain stimulation and why deep brain stimulation is indicated for Parkinson's disease. It is very good, what we call class one data that shows that deep brain stimulation truly benefit patients with Parkinson's disease, um, as I told you before. So there are several randomized control studies that supports the efficacy of DBS. The improvement in on time, in general, the results uh, show that there is a roughly 4.6 hours per day on average of improvement in on time. And this is how we quote what would be the results expected with DBS, approximately five hours of on time on average. Definitely a decrease in medication dose. In general, patients with DBS will have an average 25% reduction in medication. The reduction in tremor, roughly 75% on average. So this is the symptoms that is mostly helpful, helped with the deep brain stimulation, 75%. And definitely it all comes together with improvement in quality of life. Those four uh, points are clearly uh, defined and uh, um, uh, clarified in several papers available in the scientific literature. Now we will shift from Parkinson's disease to essential tremor. Essential tremor is another uh, movement disorder that can be very, very uh, efficiently treated with deep range stimulation. Again, the first line of treatment is medication, and once pay, fa patients fail medication, DBS can be a, a, a good option. The target for uh, essential tremor, however, is different from um, DBS for Parkinson's disease. In general, for essential tremor, you use the thalamus as our target, and there is an area in the thalamus that controls the motor skills, and this area is named VIM, and this is the target that we perform, that we use DBS, we target the DBS for essential tremor, the VIM in the thalamus. Uh, important facts about the VIM for D DBS for essential tremor, it does not cure the disease, the same thing as Parkinson. It it treats the symptoms, but not the disease itself. The DBS may not eliminate all tremor completely, but it will improve the tremor significantly. Sometimes the tremor works with uh, uh, aging despite DBS. And that's another um, important feature of DBS is that the tremor can get worse, but we can also improve the stimulation and increase the stimulation over time. So that's another benefit for DBS. In general, vocal and head tremors are difficult to treat. Um, and some DBS settings, depending on the position of elatodes, can cause some disarthritis. Those are the side effects uh, of, uh, of DBS for essential tremor. But as a take home message here, I would like to emphasize that DBS for essential tremor will improve your tremor in approximately 80% um, and handwriting approximately 70%. So it's a very efficient treatment for this type of pathology. Uh, as another uh, pathology that can be treated with the brain stimulation, we have dystonia. And again, the target for dystonia is the GPI, uh, very similar to one of the targets for uh, Parkinson's disease, but primarily dystonic symptoms, dystonia is treated uh, with DBS, uh, with GPI after failure of medical treatment. So DBS does not cure dystonia, as does not cure essential tremor, and does not cure Parkinson, but controls their symptoms. So it's affected, it's an effective treatment, but does not eliminate completely the symptoms. Uh, the symptoms may progress despite DBS, and this can be mitigated by changes in stimulation. DBS may be less effective for secondary generalized dystonia, uh, instead of primary dystonia. Primary dystonia is uh, it's a group of you know, uh, uh, pathology that will respond better with DBS. 
uh, DBS uh, may not improve the speech and the swallowing that comes together with some patients with dystonia. And in general, younger patients, they have better outcomes than other, other patients. So again, uh, we talk about, about the preoperative evaluation for deep brain stimulation. Once the patient fails medication, he is, uh, is being followed by a uh, movement disorder specialist. In general, uh, movement disorder neurologists uh, should evaluate those patients and uh, um, evaluate the need of deep brain stimulation uh, depending on the symptoms, depending on the response of the, uh, of the medication. Um, followed by a consultation with uh, uh, neurosurgery. There is a medical evaluation, and very importantly, there is a neuropsychological testing that needs to be done in order to exclude patients with, that are not candidates for DBS. And this is all done in a, in a conjoint meeting we call multidisciplinary meeting that we discuss the possible candidates for DBS, and then the patient is then referred to the surgical uh, team, and then we decide what target, what, and we discuss the complications, uh, the effects, the side effects, and if, uh, if we decide to go for surgery or not. So at this point, uh, we are passing uh, this, uh, we give a brief discussion about the indications and some results. I will pass the, uh, the word to Dr. Faraji. He's gonna talk about some technical aspects related to the implantation of the brain stimulation. Thanks, Dr. Gonzalez Martinez. Um, so I briefly want to describe to you guys, the patients, what your day would be like undergoing a deep brain stimulation procedure at our institution. The typical day starts actually a week in, weeks in advance by obtaining a preoperative MRI scan, uh, which is scheduled by our outpatient team, and usually Danielle and Dr. Gonzalez Martinez oversee that process with the neurologist. Once you have that 3D scan, we upload and create a plan about which target uh, to direct the deep brain stimulation lead towards, whether it's STN or GPI as, or VIM, as Dr. Gonzalez Martinez said. And this is all done preoperatively as part of that multidisciplinary conference. So when you come to the hospital the morning of surgery, all of the planning and all of the discussions have already taken place, and you will know what your target is uh, and, um, and we would proceed with surgery uh, after that. So the morning you come in, you come in you know, relatively early in the morning, um, you would uh, go to the preoperative area. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez would see you and check you in. Uh, and then you would be brought into the operating room after the anesthesia team worked with you and placed an IV. When you're in the operating room, uh, the general plan is to keep you awake for the middle part of the surgery, but to have you asleep in the beginning and the end of surgery as the small openings in the, in the skull are made to pass the deep brain stimulation leads down. So when you come into the operating room, a guidance frame will be attached to your head. This is the guidance frame in the bottom left of the picture. It's, a, it's called a Lexel frame. Um, this Lexel frame allows uh, a CAT scan to be made of your head that co-registers to the 3D map that you've had, the MRI that you've had as a preoperative patient, as an outpatient. And if you overlay those two images together, you can accurately guide the deep brain stimulation to the target. And so that's the purpose of this fancy frame to crown you so-called king for the day, but uh, really to make this an accurate procedure to get to the target of interest. And after surgery, by the way, this frame comes off easily and usually has no issues. So once this frame is on, you'll be, you'll be asleep for that part of the procedure. Um, the anesthesiologist and the team will work with you to keep you sleepy and comfortable so that you're not feeling the placement of the frame. And then afterwards, you'll be transported to the CAT scanner at Presbyterian Hospital. The CAT scanner is what we use to make this three-dimensional map. And oftentimes patients wake up during transport and that's perfectly expected and normal and there's usually not an issue with that. Um, and patients are quite comfortable. After the CAT scan is made, uh, you'll come back to the operating room and then you'll be positioned on the operating room table uh, and the anesthesia chain will place an arterial line to measure blood pressure usually. Um, we'll keep you comfortable with the bladder catheter uh, and, uh, and you'll be uh, honestly made comfortable until uh, the procedure starts. You can go to the next slide, Danielle. Um, during the procedure, during the awake portion of the case, 
we do uh, micro electrode recordings. And what this is basically is passing a small micrometer, very tiny electrode uh, through the brain tissue. And as we go down through the brain tissue, we map and use the ability of the machine to sense the activity of the neuron so that we can accurately identify uh, the active zone to place the electrode. And we use not only the advanced imaging that we discussed previously, but we use this as an adjunct to help us uh, really define the area of interest that we want to target the lead. And so what we do is we pass down to the different zones of the brain. We look at the activity of the neurons until we get, for instance, to the subthalamic nucleus and see the, the very typical activity, map the top and bottom of that nucleus, and then know that that's the area that we implant our lead in. And so not only do we get accurate imaging, but we get accurate real-time feedback in terms of our uh, microelectrode recordings. Go to the next slide also. The way we do this procedure in an accurate way is not only having the patients in this uh, Lex cell frame for guidance and making this 3D map, but using a surgical robot. And the surgical robot uh, we use for other procedures in neurosurgery, such as biopsies, implantation of leads for, for epilepsy monitoring, for catheter placement, even to hold um, cameras for endoscopic procedures. But really, UPMC was on the forefront of using this robot uh, in deep, deep brain stimulation surgery. And, uh, in particular, this ROSA robot and reduces operating room time, increases precision of these procedures. And also we can plan directly on this platform as well. Uh, and we can uh, register pre and post operatively the imaging to look at accuracy data um, for each individual patient. So the next slide. Uh, you can click a couple. So without going into too much detail, I wanted to just show the general accuracy that we can achieve with this robotic method. The first set of data here is looking at uh, registering the robot different ways, using a frame, using the surface recognition, et cetera. And in all cases, uh, we can achieve submillimeter accuracy in an idealistic world. Uh, the second set of data here on the bottom shows comparing the Lex cell frame, which is a standard method that had been done for the previous 20, 30 years, uh, versus the new method with the robot. And it shows that the robot method is actually more accurate in an idealistic world compared to this traditional Lexel frame method. Next slide. This is a study using a different type of robot than what we use at UPMC, and their error is one and a half millimeters, which is in the realm of normal. And this is in a setting uh, in clinical practice where it's not the idealistic world with phantom models, uh, et cetera. This is, uh, this is a good outcome, uh, but next slide, as you'll see, our study at UPMC can be a little bit better with the robot that we've developed here uh, and the workflow we've de developed here. So in particular, for our first few cases, we had equivalent um, accuracy uh, to this previous study that I mentioned, about one, one and a half millimeters. But as we be have developed the method, streamlined it, and made it more uh, applicable to each patient, we really can get sub-millimeter accuracy that approaches this idealistic data that I, uh, we discussed two slides ago. So overall, our, our accuracy is less than a millimeter, and patients have good outcomes with minimal to no complication. And Dr. Raji? Yes. Can I ask a question? Uh, why this is important for, for our patients? Why accuracy is important? Accuracy is important. I think you said this, Dr. Gonzalez, is that, is that these areas are quite small in the center of the brain. They're difficult to get to. And you really want to ensure that you hit the target accurately because of all of the areas that are around it that can be involved in things like movement of, of arm, legs, voice. It can, uh, if you're off target, you can have sensory changes, numbness. And we don't have those because we have good accuracy. So in general, um, we don't have these side effects. And actually we can test for them in the operating room as we're doing the surgery. So I'll leave this slide up and I'll just further, further describe the surgery to you. So as you're waking up um, in surgery after the openings are made in the skull, we get a baseline neurological exam to make sure that nothing has changed with your neurological exam. And then uh, we do the microelectrode recordings as I described, passing those sensing electrodes down to map the area of the brain. And then once the electrodes are in place, we can actually stimulate through those electrodes and look for um, any changes in your symptoms or any side effects that may be from implantation. And if we see side effects, we don't implant at that site and we implant at a site that is safer for you. Um, when we have good clinical control of your symptoms, which is not always seen to completion in the operating room, sometimes it takes programming afterwards, but when we see good symptom control, 
uh, then we implant a lead at that location. And if you want to add anything else, Danielle or Dr. Gonzalez, to that. Okay, Great. next slide. So typically that's your day in the operating room. You go back to sleep as the incision is closed and then you stay in the hospital one night uh, with us. You obtain a CAT scan again postoperatively to make sure that there's no uh, issue with placement, which again, typically 99.9% .9 of the time there is none. And then, uh, and then you go on to postoperative care, which I think Dr. With, that Danielle will describe to you now. Dr. Faraji, can you explain what it might feel like for a patient to be awake in the operating room? What, what are they feeling throughout the surgery? So you should, you, you would feel um, maybe some heaviness from the frame that's on the head that's holding in a position to the robot. But in terms of sensation, you may feel some numbness and tingling on the side of the body as we do stimulation. That's perfectly normal. And that's a transient temporary uh, sensation that you would feel. Um, you may feel a little tired, honestly, waking up and going back to sleep from anesthesia. That's perfectly normal as well. Uh, but pain from surgery should be well controlled uh, so that you should not feel much pain with the procedure at all as we do it. Okay, so one thing that we haven't talked about is this DBS surgery is actually done in two stages. So Dr. Faraji just explained the first stage of the surgery where we put the electrodes into the brain. After that surgery, we usually observe patients in the hospital overnight, usually just one night before you go home. And then we bring you back a few weeks later for a second surgery where we will put the battery in the chest and connect the brain electrodes to the battery. That surgery is very short. It takes about an hour and it's done as an outpatient. So you'll go home the same day. And doing both of these surgeries involves making four incisions. So there's two incisions on the top of the head here. There's one made on the right side of the head uh, above the ear and one in the chest where the battery will go. The recovery for the surgery takes about two to four weeks. Um, after the first surgery, there. Uh, you may have a mild headache. Usually um, it's controlled just by taking some over-the-counter Tylenol, and you might have some swelling in your face that will go away within a couple days or a week. Um, with the second surgery, it's also mildly painful, um, just some soreness in the neck or the chest where the incision is. You'll follow up with your surgery team about two weeks after surgery to take your stitches out. And it's important to note that after you've gone through these two surgeries, your DBS is not turned on yet. So you should not expect any improvement in your symptoms. You'll follow up, it's usually about one month after the brain surgery before your DBS gets turned on. We like to give you some time to heal from the surgery. And we've found that delaying that first programming visit means that we have to make fewer adjustments to your programming overall. So about one month after the surgery, we'll turn it on, and then you can expect to follow up with your doctor about once every uh, one to three months through for the first year, and then every six to 12 months after that. Um, and during this time, we will also adjust your medication. So your medication dose may be able to uh, be reduced. As we're turning your DBS up, we'll uh, adjust your medications at the same time. So it's important to keep in mind that the improvement from DBS is not immediate. It can take several months, um, even up to a year, to optimize the treatment. DBS programming is done in the office. You can see in this picture here um, through wireless technology. So it's done in a non-invasive way um, that you'll follow up with your, your doctor. DBS has been used um, in its current form since 1997. Uh, until recently, there was only one company that made DBS, and that was Medtronic. Um, over the last few years, there are now two more companies available in the United States that, that make DBS. And really, in the last few years, we've seen an explosion in, um, in technological advancements for DBS. I'd like you to keep in mind that all of these systems are more alike than different. They are all expected to improve the same symptoms, and um, there are just some subtle differences between them that might make one device better for a particular patient. All of these devices have a primary cell or a non-rechargeable battery available, 
that battery is expected to last about two to five years before it needs to be replaced. A DBS battery replacement is an outpatient surgery. It takes about a half an hour um, and it doesn't involve any brain surgery. It's just replacing the stimulator that's in the chest. Two of these three companies currently have a rechargeable battery available and that battery lasts for 15 years before it needs to be replaced, but it does require you to recharge the battery, maybe not every day, but at least a few times a week to keep the battery charged and working. All of these companies um, have a patient programmer that's provided with their device. So you will have the ability to turn your DBS off and on if needed. And if your uh, medical provider allows you, you may be able to turn your DBS up or down within a preset range that we give you. All of these devices are MRI safe, meaning once they're put in, you could have an MRI if one was needed. There, and two out of three of these companies have uh, some new technology. It's a directional lead. So what that means is the traditional DBS lead has uh, four contacts on the end here, these metal strips where the electrical current comes out. Um, the newer directional leads, instead of having four contacts, have eight contacts. And they're arranged in this manner where the bottom and the top contact go all the way around, but these middle two and three are divided into three segments each, like slices of pie. And we can activate all of them together. And when we, when we stimulate through that, you see a nice spherical electrical field here. And if we decide to choose just one of these segments, you can see it changes the shape of the electrical field. So why is that important? The goal of DBS programming is to stimulate the intended target, so the STN, the VIN, the GPI, but we do not want to stimulate any of the areas around that target. And there are a variety of parameters we can adjust to, to make that happen, and these directional leads give us one more parameter that we can adjust to change the shape of the electrical field. So we want to optimize the therapeutic benefit with minimizing the side effects. And that might be a little more clear with this uh, video here. On the left, you can see the traditional DBS electrode. When it's turned on, that red area indicates that it's stimulating the purple structure, which is our intended target, but you can see the red is spreading into the white area as well. So that would be uh, the undesired target, which might lead to a side effect like some tingling. But on the other side here, using the directional lead, we're stimulating the purple, but you can see there's a minimal spread of the red outside of the purple area. Um, what we've seen using these directional leads is that we've, we've seen improved outcomes, um, more programming options, and um, few, uh, better outcomes with fewer side effects. And there are each company is now looking into um, some additional technology that I think we'll see over the next couple of years, leading to even uh, further improvements in patient outcomes. Very good. I, well, thanks so much, uh, Danielle. I, I, I do have a question for her. So Danielle, we didn't talk a lot about complications of DBS surgery. So I want to know uh, how dangerous is this procedure and what type of complications we can see and uh, how to treat those. DBS is a, a very safe surgery. It's been performed uh, in the, the same form, form that we do now since 1997. Um, so it's not new or experimental in any way and we're very, um, we've really come a long way in improving the surgical uh, technique. The risks, the main risk is infection. There's about a three or 4% chance of infection with surgery. It's usually not a brain infection. It's usually at the site on the chest where the battery is. And to treat that could require antibiotics, either in a pill or sometimes through an IV. And sometimes if the infection's bad enough, it might involve removing part or all of the device to heal the infection. There is also a risk of bleeding in the brain from surgery. Um, that risk is about a half percent or one percent per surgery. Very good. Thank you. 
Well, I think this concludes the the um, the presentation. So I again, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Faraji, uh, our resident chief resident. He is uh, he spent one years uh, years with us uh, doing his uh, training in neurosurgery and also in movement disorders and epilepsy. And he'll be moving to Texas, I believe. Right, uh, Dr. Faraji? Yes, to Houston Methodist to Texas. Very good. And also, uh, well, thank you. And uh, also, I would like to thank Danielle. Uh, she's part of our team. She uh, takes care and be with patients all the time. So I appreciate that. And finally, again, we'd like to uh, ask, um, uh, thank you, uh, Mike Buffalini, and also Abbott for putting this together. And uh, we, I think we're open for any questions or any concerns. Thank you. If there are any questions, I will unmute the line. So feel free to ask a question to the panelists, please. This, the content was great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, I really appreciated the overview. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any questions, we will conclude this uh, seminar and look forward to the next installment, which we will be hopefully have in, over the next a few weeks. Um, thank you again for your time. And this record, this pre presentation will be available um, after this is over via the UPMC neurosurgical link. Thank you for your time.